Valley Talk on News Talk 1580 KGAL. Hey, welcome to Valley Talk. We're going to have a very interesting time on the show today. We have uh, District Attorney for Lynn County, Doug Martini, in the studio Hello. with us. Doug, glad uh, you decided. Thanks for, thanks for having me. We had him scheduled earlier, but then we had to bump him and move some things around because of some other scheduling things or things we were trying to cover. So we do appreciate you coming back on this day. Thank you. And then, of course, our average investment guy, John Gibson, is in the studios today. We are going to be talking to John, first of all, about what's going on in Cyprus and the uh, implications that has possibly for the United States. Um, we'll talk to John about that a little bit. And then for the rest of the show, from like 15 minutes after 11 till noon, we're going to be talking to Doug um, about uh, district attorney issues. We're going to talk about concealed carry. We'll talk about sentencing guidelines, jail space in Lynn County. Measure 11 question, sentencing, and uh, I'm sure there's a lot of things that will come up in that conversation. So thank you for being with us today. Thank you for coming on a live radio show here in Lynn County and talking about these issues. Yeah, thanks, Dave. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Quiznos, taste on us. Don't forget we give away a $10 gift certificate every day during the show, and we're taking your submissions now. Just send me an email, dave at kgal.com, or call the station at 926-KGAL, 451-KGAL, and at the end of the show, we'll draw a name out of the hat, and that lucky person will get a $10 gift certificate, good for any sub-sandwiches in the store, or drinks or chips, whatever. Take your buddy there, have lunch on us, because the taste is on us. Quizner's in Albany, next to Novak's Restaurant, and across the parking lot from the former G.I. Joe Sporting Goods location. Thanks to Dale and the crew for being involved here at... Um, KGAL's Valley Talk. Also, by the way, we're working on getting something set up on a Twitter thing, so you can go in there and sign up, and then as they have specials, they'll tweet those out to you. So thanks, Dale, for uh, being a part of the Valley Talk family here at KGAL. Cyprus, John Gibson, our average investment yeah. guy. Uh, kind of scary deals going on there. With one of, the, one of the options that was on the table was 10% of... If you had an account, 10% of that would be going to help pay for the bailout of the banking system in Cyprus. Well, they fixed that. They made it 40%. Now it's 40%. So, <laughs> hold on. It could be 50 by the time we're done. Who knows? But uh, here's what happened. Um, two weeks ago, on a, on a Friday, everybody went to bed and in Cyprus. And everybody had their money in a bank, just like we do. And over the weekend, they, the parliament... Uh, met and decided that they had to have a bailout because they were out of money and so they were going to do a number of steps and they said nothing about it and they were going to vote on an early Monday morning before anybody heard about it well what happened was people started to tweet about it funny you should mention tweet um, and the word got out that they were going to seize money out of people's bank accounts and the people went crazy and wrote no on their hand i don't know if you've seen the pictures on tv but they're standing there with a no on their hand and so they decided that the only solution was to absolutely close the banks because now that word was out people were going to go to the bank and withdraw all their money and have a run on the bank so now for the last two weeks almost the banks have been closed um which means you can't do any... Tra I, I just bought an investment property. You know, I had to wire a sum of money to the title company. And that would have not happened if I was in Cyprus. Um, people it's got to be hard on the businesses over there. Well, they're, they're closed. Right. And people, the ATMs are running out of money. You're limited to, I believe, 30 euros, which would equate to, I think, $35 a day. Uh, so for us, with $4 gas, you know, that would hurt. Um, it's a gas tank. It's a tank full of gas. Yeah. So <clears throat> basically what has happened now, they've come out and they've said the IMF, International Monetary Fund, and the European Union, they're all going to infuse a bunch of money into Cyprus. But part of the deal is Cyprus has to have some skin in the game. So Cyprus has decided, the government has decided that if you have over the equivalency of $130,000 in a bank account, which would be 100,000 euros, if you, anything above that is uninsured in their banking system, like ours is insured up to 250, well, they only insure up to 100. So anything over 100 euros, they're going to take 40% off before they open the bank. Okay, so they're going to take their cut right now, and then you get what's left over, and what are you going to do? I'm going to run down and push you out of the way and get my money first, right? So there's a huge problem here, 
And this is what wow. we are looking at. I've, I've come on every week and I've said, you know, we're going to pump another $85 billion this month into the banking system to buy up bad housing debt. And we can't stop that, you know. We, if we stop that, our economy grinds to a halt, and then we're Cyprus. So this is where we're at, all right? And so all this jockeying around and all this kicking the can down the road, okay, we have an example in front of us right here, all right? This is a country smaller than Rhode Island, all right? Or Vermont, I'm sorry. Our least productive state in the Union is Vermont. Sorry if you live in Vermont. Yeah, sorry, guys. Personal. Um, it's also the home of our only socialist congressperson. I forget his name, uh, but he's been there forever. Um, but their GDP is smaller than Vermont. And look at the ripple effect it's having on the world, all right? I mean, imagine us. Look at Spain and Portugal. These guys all have GDP, uh, percentage of debt to GDP greater than Cyprus. And Cyprus's debt to GDP is 82%. I believe it's Spain is 117%. All right, ours is approaching 100%. So, <clears throat> you know, this is this is reality, okay? This is going to happen. And and so if it's people here in America, you know, you go to bed on a Friday night and you got over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars you know how do you you know right now there's ways that you do that with overnight lending and treasury bonds and stuff like that that the bank can guarantee over 250 but it's a mm -hmm. something i've never had to worry about um but you know just imagine that well what if what if the state decided that you know hey we're out of money you know you owe us 20 percent of the value of your house you know just because. So this is where we're at. You know, what you have is not always yours. What is the instant ripple effect going to be of this Cyprus bank deal on the economy of the United States and on the Wall Street? What's Wall Street saying about this or well, responding? <clears throat> we did have a very bad two-year auction today. We, we, we auctioned off a bunch of two-year notes. Normally, you have what's called a bid-to-cover ratio. So it's normally like, uh, it's usually around 3.7. So for every dollar, for every bid, there's 3.7 bids. So there's a lot of demand for that bond. Today, it was down to 3.29. That's a pretty significant decline. What happens then when it becomes harder to sell the bond, then you're forced to pay a higher yield. And that's what fuels inflation. And, and so right now we have the Treasury Department tamping down interest rates, desperately hoping the housing market can take off. And the housing market is getting better. I mean, housing prices, new home sales were down 5% year to year uh, this last month. But home prices are up. So that's encouraging. Um, what's, what's really going to affect everything is when the other countries start to fall. So right now, everybody, you know, we just built out Greek. Greece, you know, that was a struggle. Now they're all billing out Cyprus, and then comes Spain. And the unfortunate thing that came out, and the thing that did spook the market yesterday, and why it ended down, was one of the people came out yesterday and said, this just may be a model for how we fix the rest of Europe. I remember hearing that quote. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. That's scary. Yeah, it's very scary. Very scary. So what it's, what it's going to prompt people to do is, uh, I'm not going to leave my money in the bank. Right, right. Uh, they'll just run down there and they'll get it. They'll, they'll find, try to find, uh, you know, a coffee cup or a can and try to bury it someplace where nobody's looking and, and hide it. Well, in World War II, there was, um, I don't know the exact law, and I'm sitting here with a, a <laughs> very smart man, so I don't want to say something stupid. But, uh, I mean, there were laws against hoarding gold and cash, I thought, during World War II. I don't if I'm wrong somebody call and correct me but i mean our government has has gotten a little frisky with you know personal accounts and things like that and and what if you have a brokerage account you know what if the government shuts down our banking system and says we're broke what if they start attacking people for not a well, attacking is a strong word what if they start taking a portion of everybody's 401k what if it gets down to not just the rich people because right now we just hate you know we, we've been taught to hate the rich people at this point. Well, uh, Robin Hood, he was your <coughs> hero, right? 
mm-hmm. stole from the rich, gave to the poor? Yeah. Well, Doug, here's, a, here's a question for you. Okay. If, uh, if you were a financial advisor in Cyprus two weeks ago and you'd had a tip that this was going to happen, where would you be advising people to put their money? Um, well, I would have gone to gold or cash, dollars. You know, I would have gone. The dollar is still king. So I would have gone to dollars. The U.S. dollar. Yeah, the U.S. dollar. Still king. Still king. Worldwide. Uh, worldwide. Okay. Um, doing fine. You say that with a raised pitch in your voice. Well, the thing that, the thing that scares me, and, and here's, here's what I think about at 2 in the morning. Russia came out and said, you know, we'll be willing to help you. But boy, you got a lot of natural gas that you guys just found offshore, you know. Yeah, we'll help you out, but we're going to take a little bit of your natural gas. What if China flew over here and brought all of those treasury bills over and just said, here, Doug, but we sure like all these trees. We're going to take your trees, and we'll give you back all your debt, and we're done. And suddenly, private, public lands aren't... Aren't private anymore. Right. So think that, about it. That could be raise some very interesting constitutional questions that would have mm-hmm. to be addressed, and... That could be very interesting dialogue. Hopefully, we don't have to have that. Mm-hmm. that well, the only thing that saved Cyprus was they just found natural gas. And natural gas is twice as expensive as it is here over in Europe. They, they don't have the pipelines. They don't have the facilities. Uh, so that's a gold mine. That's the only thing that saved Cyprus. And now they have to give it up. Black gold. Remember the mm-hmm. Beverly Hillbillies? Mm-hmm. Black gold. Yeah. Texas tea. Texas tea. Yep. Anything else before we uh, move on? <clears throat> Catch a One quick here. thing. Um, the government is out of the car business. Uh, one thing that you haven't heard on any of the broad- news broadcasts is that uh, the government came out and said they will sell their remaining stake in GM by the end of the year, which means for the end of the year, you're going to have a lot of flooded shares of GM coming on the market, which is going to make it a tough investment. But the downside is, and I didn't get a quote this morning, I'm thinking it's trading around 25. It has to trade at 53 to break even. So I guess, I guess the government is just about as bad at investing as I am, because I've made trades like that too. I just didn't make them as quite as much money, and it was my money I made them with, not yours. So we're all going to take a big loss. Okay. So there you go. Have a good day. Hey, John, thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, look forward to what's going on next Tuesday. Right now in the studio is Doug Martini, the uh, Lynn County District Attorney. Doug, uh, glad to have you with us today. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. A lot of things I want to talk about. Sentencing guidelines, jail space, Lynn County, Measure 11 questions, concealed carry. Of course, the sheriff in Lynn County said, uh, raised quite a bit of uh, interest nationwide. It was on the Glenn Beck Show and so on and so forth. Um, when he sent a letter to the vice president saying he was not going to enforce... Uh, a law if it required that guns would be taken away from the citizens of Lynn County. So, first of all, let's back up. What does the district attorney's office do? What What do you guys do? Uh, we are in charge of prosecuting crimes that occur in Lynn County. And uh, so what that entails is law enforcement agencies collect evidence, and I'm the one, or my deputy district attorneys and I, we're the ones who present it in the courtroom. And so we're actually not an investigatory body. We're the ones who make the arguments in the courtroom. We're the ones who are pursuing and seeking to have justice happen in the courtroom. And so uh, that's really what we do. Do, Does every case go through a grand jury? No. Felonies go through the grand jury. Oh, okay. Yep. Do you have enough deputies? Uh, I'd love to have more, but uh, the voters are good to us, and uh, we have sufficient for our needs right now. How many do you have? We have 12. Actually, we're in the process of hiring one, so right now 11. Okay. Um, Budget situation, tight? tight, uh, but again, we're thankful to the to the voters of Lynn County. Uh, they've treated us well, and we're going to use their dollars uh, very wisely, and uh, we're thankful for what they've given us. Is there enough, are the courts and your office funded enough to, I'm going to use the word that's kind of subjective or objective, to get cases through the system? Uh, we, that is a struggle right now, and we, we definitely could use more, uh, another judge we could use more deputy DAs to push them through faster, um, but again, that it takes funds. You gotta you gotta have the money for that, and so uh, budgets are tight right now, and we're all doing the best we can. What kind of backlog are we looking at? Uh, we're setting trials right now for felony cases. Let's say it's a one-day trial, probably about uh, May. 
is where we're sitting. I mean, if May it's, a, if it's a multi-day case, then we're in the summer. We're you know, there's, the there's a part of me that likes that because the guy, I always assume they did the bad thing. So that's kind of wrong. <laughs> I'd be a terrible juror. But uh, it makes them sweat it out that much longer. Well, <laughs> and the thing and the thing is, is, is uh, I believe... Uh, Justice delayed is generally justice denied. My cases generally don't get better over time. Right. They usually get worse over time. Witnesses move away. Right, right. Those kinds of things. It's and hard probably to most people don't care. What some people don't even care that they've broken a the law. So. Oh yeah. You know. You bet. I remember years ago when uh, the state ran out of money and they closed the closed the uh, courts on Friday. That's right. I remember that. And they could only all of the civil cases back of the bus, back of the line. Yep. And I had a uh, divorce thing that was going on at that time. And, boy, it, getting that through the court system then was uh, almost mm. impossible. Well, here's another interesting thing. I was there when that happened. Yeah. And they actually took some crimes. That, this was the judicial department. They, they said some crimes were not going to process. One of them was un unauthorized use of a vehicle, which is stolen cars, right. stolen vehicles. Uh, and so what would happen is someone would get picked up for stolen vehicle, taken to the jail, but because we can't arraign them, uh, they're released. And so uh, I had a case That's where... That's a bad thing to get it's out. It's very bad, especially <laughs> if you're a car dealer, because I had a case uh, of a car dealer who was just sick and tired. This is in Salem. Uh, none of our car dealers here, of course, did this, but uh, was sick and tired of his cars being stolen, and he went on a chase, and he was chasing folks down. That's a bad situation for us to be in. Uh, that was just a few years ago. Wow. So. Hopefully we don't get to that point again. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, I think the first thing we want to talk about is concealed carry. Okay. And yeah. uh, we'll talk, want to uh, hear uh, Doug Martini's position on it, and you might be surprised. Stick around. Valley Talk will continue here in just a moment. When you look out across the Willamette Valley, you'll see plenty of banking choices. Willamette Community Bank is here to give you an option that's pretty unique, like no other, in fact. Hi, this is Sue Kalina, Relationship Manager. Willamette Community Bank provides an alternative to large national and regional banks by offering customized financial services and local decision-making to benefit local people, local families, and local businesses. How many banks can say that? Willamette Community Bank, service like no other. Member FDIC equal housing lender. Going out to lunch at a nice restaurant can be expensive, and the big portions put you more in the mood for a nap than a productive afternoon. Mama's Fine Italian to the Rescue. The small appetite senior menu is just right. Anyone and everyone is invited to order from the Light Appetites menu for lunch from 11 4 p.m. with tasty entrees beginning at only $3.95. Why go hungry or go anywhere else for lunch? Eat healthy, eat light at Mama's. Close Sunday and Monday, so make the most of Tuesday through Friday and join your friends at Mama's for lunch. Dinner only on Saturday. Mama's features charbroiled steaks every day. Make reservations for dinner or pick up a bottle of fine wine. Seating is limited, so please call for reservations. 541-451-5050. That's 451-5050. Mama's Fine Italian and Wine Shop. On West Oak, between Main and 2nd in Lebanon. Across from the Big Blue Napa Auto Parts Building. Albany's Mennonite Home is pleased to have earned a perfect score from the state of Oregon surveyors, making Mennonite Home one of the top-skilled nursing and rehabilitation facilities in Oregon, providing the highest possible quality of care. As part of the Mennonite Village Retirement Community, Mennonite Home provides the rehabilitation and therapy services for people of all faiths transitioning from a hospital stay to home. They work directly with each resident's health care, pharmacy, and insurance providers, making life easier for residents and their families. A wide range of resident programs are offered to meet individual interests, including outdoor gardening, scenic walks, cooking and baking, art and music, pet therapy, and brain fitness activities. Mennonite Home is where you'll find superior standards and amazing levels of devotion. The proof is in their reputation and resident satisfaction. Rooms are currently available. Call Gerilyn at 541-928-7232 or visit MennoniteHome.com. Homeowners, business owners, take note of this name and number. Gonzalez Yard Care has a growing list of very satisfied customers because Ignacio Gonzalez and his crew are different from other landscape maintenance operations. No mow, blow, and go. How about weeding by hand? Work by the job, the season, or year-round? Handyman work as needed? Senior discounts? With Gonzalez Yard Care, you get what the big guys offer and a lot more. Call today for a free estimate. Gonzalez Yard Care at 541-926-1412. 
1512. Yahoo Sports Radio, weekends on 1580. KGAL. Yahoo! Welcome back to Valley Talk. Doug Martini is the District Attorney in Lynn County. You're with us in the studios today, as well as John Gibson, Average Investment Guy. We talked about Cyprus a moment ago, and we're going to talk about, to Doug uh, about various things with the District Attorney's Office for the next half hour of the show. Doug, first of all, thank you for allowing us to speak to you. I know you're really busy. I know your office is busy, busy but I do thank you for coming on the show and talking live about some of these issues. Thanks for having me. Let's talk about concealed carry. Uh, the sheriff in Lynn County... Um, got quite a bit of press because he sent a letter to uh, the vice president saying this is what the constitution says and I'm here to uphold the constitution and I'm not taking guns away from our citizens. Um, you support that? Absolutely. He, he, uh, I, I received a few phone calls uh, as well. Uh, most all positive. I received one that was negative. Uh, and really, I, I have to put on my constitutional law professor hat, though I've never been a professor uh, you know, on this topic. But This is your chance. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Here it is. is uh, there are three branches of government. There's the judicial branch, the executive branch, and uh, the sheriff is part of the executive branch. And as part, every branch of government is su supposed to interpret the Constitution. Now, in the end, the... Supreme Court is the ultimate arbiter of the Constitution, but every branch is supposed to interpret the Constitution. And so the legislature, uh, they shouldn't uh, be passing laws without first looking and making sure that their law doesn't violate the Constitution in their opinion. Uh, I'm in the executive branch, and so let me give you a hypothetical here. Let's say the legislature passed a law that says, hey, it's a misdemeanor to say bad things about Governor Kitzhopper. Uh, and if you do, it's five days jail. Should I enforce that? That's a violation of the First Amendment. Freedom of uh, speech. And so as the executive branch, I should interpret the Constitution and not enforce that law. The sheriff, I think, is expressing his thoughts or his belief on the Second Amendment, which is his right and actually his duty. And so uh, a lot of folks that were upset about what he said, uh, I don't think they understand how the Constitution works. In the end, the Supreme Court is the final arbiter, but certainly every branch, legislative, executive, judicial, every branch is supposed to interpret the Constitution. So, People that may just look at this from a... They might think, and I think some people were surprised. Uh, to be quite honest, I, I thanked him for sending that letter to the Vice President because I totally agree with everything he wrote in that letter. Just get that out there. Uh, I say that before I say this next question. Some people might think government and and uh, Doug, you, in, because you're the district attorney here in Lynn County, you might represent to them government. Oh, yes. I, I'm reminded of the word government every time I do a closing argument. Defense attorney doesn't refer to me as the, the state or Doug Martini. I'm the government. You're the so. government. A pejorative you're the term, guy. Of course. That's right. You're, you're the bad guy. I've been looking for you. Yes, it's always used pejoratively on me. And now you're a nice guy, man. <laughs> and so you would think that law enforcement and the district attorney wants to take all guns from the people because some people think, well, if we have fewer guns out there, it would make it safer. That's something I absolutely do not agree with at all. And um, so, what do you think? Well, let, let, me, let me tell you a conversation I had just recently uh, with a member of the Oregon State uh, SWAT team. Uh, who actually has to respond to these kinds of things. And, uh, you know, they have, they're trained on what do you do for these situations when you have an active shooter. He shared with me a stat, uh, which was this. Uh, of course, there's stats on these, these uh, mass shootings that go down. Uh, the average death, number of deaths at a uh, mass shooting like, the, like we see in the news a lot of times is 18 when there's not a citizen around who has a concealed carry or they're carrying a weapon. But when there is a citizen, it's two. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty significant That's difference huge. in numbers. And we saw that play out in Portland. Right. Because, in because Portland, a guy, some other guy pointed a gun at the shooter, and, and didn't he leave? He That's ducked right. behind his stairwell and shot himself. So, uh, for me, um, I, I want to make sure that criminals don't have guns. That's for sure. We, yeah. we prosecute felon in possession of firearm all the time. So. And there are certain guidelines when you have a concealed carry permit. There's certain things you can't do, so you can't take it in post offices and, you know, private uh, facilities. Let's, let's talk about that, a concealed carry. Uh, in private facilities, if there's a sign on the door saying it's not allowed, let's take, for example, the um, uh, fairgrounds, Lynn County Expo Center, sign on the door saying you're not allowed to bring weapons into this building. If you do bring a weapon in, they 
you're, you can be trespassed. In other words, they can ask you to leave. Well, it's, it's been a while since I've researched out the issue with regards to uh, where where people can take concealed weapons and those kinds of things. But, uh, for example, when I was at, I, I started my law career at the Oregon Tax Court, and uh, my judge asked me to do a research project on whether or not he could make it illegal for firearms to be brought into the building that we were in. The Chief Justice had sent out a memo saying, all judges, I want you to order no weapons, no firearms in your building. Well, in the building that we were in, uh, it was we, we occupied one floor of the building in Salem, but there were about four or five other floors uh, that ocup occupied by other entities. Uh, and so the judge wondered whether or not he had the authority to actually order that. Uh, so I did research on that. My conclusion was is that he had authority to order it for the court house the level that he was at, the fourth floor, uh, but not beyond that. So, But I do think that uh, private individuals certainly have the authority to, for example, if I wanted to say, no one, in, no one that comes to my house can have a weapon, a firearm. I, I, I can make that restriction, and it should be abided by. It's my house. But now, let's right? go back to the fairgrounds real quick. So right. suppose that I do have a concealed carry, right. and I choose not to um, obey their rule. I might figure that that's arbitrary, you know. Um, and so I go in and I go in. Can I be charged with a crime? Um, you're asking a question I need to do research. Oh, I'm yeah, going to yeah, give you yeah. the typical attorney answer, which I'm very trained in giving, which is, it depends. It depends. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. But uh, uh, bottom line is, uh, if I, let's say I put up a restriction, I'll go back to, you're asking mm -hmm. about a kind of yeah. a government entity, yeah. really, Fairgrounds is owned yeah. by, by the county. By the county. Uh, it's easier for me to answer if you ask me about a private, a entity. private entity. So if I okay. said, uh, nobody can come into my house with a firearm, period. And if you, you do... You post that. And I post it. Okay. And, I, but I, and if you do, uh, you're trespassing on my property. If I announce that and someone does, they're trespassing. And so I suppose I could, I mm -hmm. could prosecute someone for trespassing I see. in that instance. I see. With regards to your question about the fairgrounds... That's the answer of, it depends. Let so, me research yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, I understand. But, I mean, as a private citizen, I don't like gun-free zones. You know, they, they scare me. Well, you know, we're getting into personal opinion here. I, I totally agree with you uh, that, and as I've talked about, you know, I'm very concerned. I do not like reading stories. You know, my heart breaks for these families when, when there's you, you, school shootings where 18 kids have died. You know, two-year-olds, uh, kindergartens, you know, you, you, there's something inside of me that just gets physically ill when I read stories like that. And what these shooters do is they go into gun-free areas. They don't go into police stations. They don't go into uh, places. They don't go into gun clubs. Uh, they go into places where nobody can defend themselves. And what they want to do is wreck as much carnage as they possibly can in as short a time as possible. And then they kill themselves. And that's, you know, it's, it's sick. It is. Yeah. And the sad thing is none of the laws and the but proposals... The stat that, would that, fix that Doug that just quoted is interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the pattern of what's going on, um, that's, that's where they go. Well, and I think an armed citizenry... Um, and there was a story that we just ran on the other day on, uh, on KGAL. Uh, Mark did a story. There was a, um, uh, somebody who was burglarizing a business. And the citizen woke oh, up. Oh, yes. I, I think I read that in the paper. Yeah, the citizen woke up, got a gun, and went and held the person at gunpoint <laughs> until <laughs> He was like 87, arrived. I believe. 82 yeah. or 87. Yep. Yeah, so, good for him, man. Anyway, go ahead. I mean, let me say one more thing uh, to, to uh, another criticism that I heard heaped upon the sheriff, but I want to have his back on this one as well. Sure. And that is, uh, you know, is he picking and choosing what laws to enforce or not to enforce? And, and the question. answer to that is absolutely. And in fact... Uh, the executive branch is supposed to do that. Uh, think of the medical marijuana laws. Uh, the medical marijuana laws, it's, it's still illegal federally. Uh, so should the sheriff continue to round up folks uh, that are all the medical marijuana uh, folks that have uh, cards? Uh, they're violating the federal law. And so, uh, you know, none of those folks came out and complained to the sheriff when he talked about, when he made the decision, I'm not going to enforce that federal law. Uh, but a lot of folks did come I out. I just can't believe there was that the, much negative. I mean, all I heard was positive. Oh, no. There was a lot of positive. No, a I lot, lot called, more positive than negative. I more. called and said, thank you, thank you, yep. you know. I mean, for God's sakes, finally stand up for somebody, you know. I mean, yeah. and then and, and do the SWAT teams all have seven clips, seven bullets in their clips now? Or Well, 
I can tell you. Oh, how that's, him on that that's classified. <laughs> I get to see all the criminals stopping and taking out three of their bullets out of their clips. You know, oh, we're in compliance. Give us your money. There you go. Hey, more on a conversation with Doug Martini, Lynn County District Attorney. We're going to talk about jail space, Lynn County. We'll talk about Measure 11. We'll talk about sentencing guidelines. Uh, where are we in the state of Oregon as far as that? And more conversations about that. By the way, if you want to get involved in the conversation, uh, we will take emails. Email questions only at dave at kgal.com. Dave at kgal.com. And we'll filter those, you know, please no derogatory whatever. And we can't talk about specific cases on the air. But let's take a shot at it and see if you want to get involved in the conversation as well. This is Valley Talk, and we'll be right back. The Osgood File, sponsored by Sage, software and services for your small and mid-sized businesses. Believe in your numbers. To learn more, visit sagetoday.com. This is Dave Ross, in for Charles Osgood. It's a national park with snow-capped mountains, crystal blue lakes, and if you look very carefully, you might spot a snow leopard. And there are no crowds and no reservations necessary because this national park is in Afghanistan. More after this from Charlie. If you want to send an Easter treat to your nieces, nephews, or grandkids this year, I've got an idea for you. How about some giant, freshly dipped, mouth-watering strawberries from Sherry's Berries? I've tasted these fresh, juicy berries, and they are fantastic. They're covered in white milk and dark chocolatey goodness, topped off with chocolate chips, nuts, or decorative swizzle. And since you listen to the Osgood Files, Sherry's Berries has a special Easter offer for you. Order Sherry's Berries starting at $19.99. That's over 40% savings. And for just $10 more, you can double the berries. To send this amazing Easter treat, call Sherry's Berries at 1-866-THE-WORD-FRUIT-02. That's 1-866-FRUIT-02. Or even better, go to berries.com. That's B-E-R-R-I-E-S.com. Click the microphone at the top of the page and type in my last name, Osgood. O-S-G-O-O-D. That's berries.com and enter Osgood. Hurry, Easter is this Sunday, so order now. It's known as Afghanistan's Grand Canyon, a place called Bandi Amir. 230 square miles of brush-covered hills, cliffs, and lakes at the foot of the Hindu Kush Mountains. Once upon a time, it made a perfect hideout for smugglers and terrorists. But now, it's become Afghanistan's first national park. CBS's Kelly Cobier reports that all it took was little money from the U.S. to hire a staff of park rangers once the landmines were cleared. Ajiza here was one of the first. He and a dozen others like him are being paid to protect this place, a project funded by USAID. They watch for poachers, they look out for wildlife, they talk to tourists. And even though it seems strange, a huge nature preserve in a country that's already pretty close to nature, Kelly reports that it's working. Marzia's family used to survive by collecting shrub brush from the hills for fuel. Now they rent out a room to tourists for about $27 a night. You can even cruise along the surface of the remote lakes by renting little blue paddle boats shaped like swans. Of course, getting to Afghanistan's first national park is not an easy trip. The only access is a treacherous road from Kabul. But there are plans in the works for an airstrip so that maybe someday adventure travelers from the U.S. might journey there to get a different perspective on the country we have spent so many years trying to rescue. The Osgood File, Dave Ross, on the CBS Radio Network. Business owners and managers, the Lebanon Chamber Biz Expo is Tuesday, April 16th. Now is the time to order quality promotional gifts from Gateway Imprints. For a limited time, pay just $75 for a two-color, three-by-five banner, or just $40 for 500 glossy, single-sided business cards, and save 10% on printing your brochures. For more ideas, check out gatewayimprints.com or look inside the Big Cream and Blue Llama building at the corner of Ash and Park Streets, Lebanon. Gateway Imprints, imprinting the seeds for success. If you're looking for a place to network with employers and set the stage for a rewarding career in the future, then this is the event for you. It's the LBCC Career Fair, Thursday, April 11th. Explore career opportunities with some of the region's top employers. Learn about LBCC programs and training opportunities. Visit with agencies that provide services to job seekers. And attend free workshops to enhance your job search. If you're searching for a job or looking to move up in the workforce, don't miss the annual LBCC Career Fair on Thursday, April 11th.
Looking to save money on lighting fixtures, lamps, shades, gifts, home decor? Larry and Marge Tomlin, owners of J&J Electric, invite you to compare prices but don't buy until you've seen the high quality and low prices at J&J Electric. Visit J&J's spectacular showroom. Allow plenty of time for browsing. You'll find antiques, gifts, home decor, and of course those beautiful lighting fixtures. The hometown folks at J&J Electric appreciate your business. J&J Electric, South Pacific at 22nd in Albany. Want to really know more? Just point, click, and learn from the Mid-Valley's best website, KGAL.com. Welcome back to Valley Talk, and we're live once again on the radio. And uh, thank you for being with That's us, cool. Doug Martini, Lynn County District Attorney, and uh, John Gibson, Average Investment Guy. Let's talk about jail space, Lynn County. Uh, there is, as I understand it, there's kind of a spoked wheel. There's three pods in the Lynn County Jail. Is that correct? Uh, I actually don't know the exact, okay. the exact number of pods. But I don't that, think any of us have ever been in the jail. So <laughs> I let's haven't either. Put that on the air. <laughs> but there has been, there's an area or a housing unit that's not open right now, correct? Right now. That's correct. Yep. Where are we as far as jail space? Do we have a jail space? Do we need to open it up? What's the situation in Lynn County as far as uh, space? If you got a, a guy, you say, we, can, we need to get this guy off the street. Do you have enough space to do it? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Uh, you know, if, I, if, I, if we could get that pot open, that would be great. And I know the sheriff, that's a high priority for him. I know it's a high priority for our commissioners as well. Uh, but we, we are actually very if I can use the term blessed with regards to this. We're very blessed in this county. Uh, we are not suffering like a lot of counties uh, with regards to jail space. Uh, and that's, that's a, you know, that, that reflects well on our commissioners who have done a good job with the budget. It also reflects well on our, our voters who have put public safety as a very high priority when they pass the law enforcement levies. And so uh, we're very lucky that way. Could we use more beds? You bet. But uh, when it comes to when the where the rubber meets the road when it comes down time for us to uh, make sure we have someone that is very dangerous that we need to keep off the streets. We have space for them. You are, are we in the spot where you release people early like another? Oh, sure. Every county is on that. Okay. It's called matrixing, and uh, you, you, there's a matrix that's put in place to, you know, the lowest level offender is the one who we kick out if we don't have enough space. I see. So the lowest lender for, so if the worse you are, the more apt you are to stay in jail. Absolutely. That's what we want. That's correct. Sentencing guidelines, Oregon. We're talking about Measure 11 here in a minute, but sentencing guidelines as they stand in Oregon, and we could talk about this for hours. Oh, I could, yes. Where are we as far as Oregon? If Let's say, Doug, we gave you the book and said, here, okay, what do you think? Let's see. You go ahead and change it. What would you like to see in Oregon? Carte is blanche. It, I can do whatever I want. Yeah, okay. it's, your, it's your day to shine. Uh, for me, what I would do is, uh, well, first of all, let me give you a little bit of a history. Uh, the, the term guidelines is actually, it, it's the wrong term. They're actually caps. They're sentencing caps that are put in place that restrict a judge from sentencing someone beyond a certain amount. Let me give you an example. Uh, I once convicted a guy of his 51st conviction. Think about that. Wow. 51st. 51 times we have, the voters, we paid for his defense attorney. 51 times we paid for a judge. 51 times we paid for a prosecutor. Uh, and he committed robbery, a non-measure 11 robbery. So he's subject to what we call guidelines. Uh, and I got a 14-month sentence. I got the maximum, and it's 14 months. 14 that was the cap. Months. That was the cap that we call guidelines. And so... That was put in place first. The voters got sick of that, and so they later passed Measure 11. So Measure 11 is now in place. Uh, that wouldn't have fixed. It didn't fix my problem on that 51st so conviction. So the 51st guy, so. how much time did he actually serve? He served probably 11 months, I would bet, because a lot of folks don't realize this as well. We have what's called transitional leave time, which right now is 30 days. The legislature's right now. Some of them are trying to make it up to 90 days, where they get out early for this trans for transitional time you also get a 30 percent cut for earned time which is given automatically and then you unearn it by bad be having bad behavior in the prison system so uh, so he didn't serve his full time that's interesting yeah. and health care along the way oh, dental care yeah. so measure 11 the pendulum swings the other way as measure 11 swung too far in your opinion oh no no uh measure 11 too far meaning uh, uh you know like the like your example, the fifty first conviction of this guy only serves eleven 14. months, fourteen yeah. months. Yeah, well, fourteen down to eleven. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, measure eleven was a reaction from Oregon voters saying, you know, man, these guys are are killing us literally, and they're getting away with murder. No, uh, if if you so look measure at 11 measure eleven, is more, 
restrictive in sentencing. Oh, yes. If you look at Measure 11 uh, and, and you actually read what crimes it is we're sentencing people for for Measure 11, it's only violent crimes. Uh, Oregon has, actually, Oregon's incarceration rate is 33rd in the nation. Uh, we are absolutely not a lock em up state. Actually, we incarcerate uh, the lowest number of nonviolent offenders of any state in the nation. We're the lowest. Uh, we're the second lowest for incarcerating drug crimes, any state in the nation. Uh, we only incarcerate, well, by large part, we, we incarcerate the violent offenders. And so, uh, and that's covered by Measure 11. What about drug crimes? Are we seeing an increase of that? We're here on the I-5 corridor, California, you know, Mexico's down south, uh, the Mexican drug cartels. Interesting um, you should ask me that. I actually, uh, fresh, or hot off the press, I Hot off say. the press. I have my, I ran my stats for 2012. Uh, methamphetamine has Possession of methamphetamine has been our number one felony for since I've been a prosecutor. Uh, but heroin last year jumped onto our top ten. Really? First time I've ever seen that. When I first got, when I first started prosecuting about 12 years ago, I'd see a heroin case maybe once a year. Uh, last year, my office prosecuted 93 cases of, of unlawful heroin? possession of heroin. Yes, we've seen a, an increase in that. So drugs are absolutely a problem. You Why know. is that? Why more heroin? Um, Did it because we... Uh, crack down on the the, the um, uh, contents for making meth. Well, let me let me just give let me just talk from sure. Doug Martinez' yeah, standpoint. Your opinion. Here we go, Doug yeah. Martinez' opinion. Uh, we have had a large uh, influx about four years ago, five years ago. I started seeing a lot more abuse of prescription meds, narcotics, uh, depressants, and a lot of those kids. We, we refer to them sometimes as pill poppers. Uh, now are graduated from high school, and they keep looking for the next better drug for them, and heroin is the next step. And uh, a lot of times I see my marijuana folks go to methamphetamine. I see the pill popper folks move to heroin. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense because actually it's in the same, it's just, they have similar effects on the body, uh, just more pronounced effects on the body. Heroin is bad. And if you, oh, if you, yes. if you go back Court economically terrible. five years ago, that's when we went down. I, I wonder if part of it's economics, that they're just giving up. I know kids that just won't work. That just, oh, yeah. you know. So, d back to the sentencing questions once again, Doug. Mm -hmm. uh, should we give the judges more leniency in saying, okay, just take a look at the case individually on, on the case on the merit of that case sentence and not cap them or say you have to do a certain thing instead of tying the judge's hands like we've done in some respects in Oregon have we tied the judge's hands too much should we give them more freedom I, I actually think our system that we have right now is a good system is it perfect no but I think it's a good system uh, we put we put before the judge the facts of the crime and there are there is discretion given to the judges on sentencing a lot of folks don't realize this in measure 11 uh, they're the lowest level of Measure 11 crimes, like your assault in the second degree, robbery in the second degree. Judges have discretion to opt out of Measure 11 uh, if certain facts are present in the particular case. And so the, the judges do have discretion. Now, if I go back to your question of sure. if I were king for a day, uh, if you were to get rid of Measure 11, I would absolutely want to get rid of the guideline caps. I'll call them caps. And then give the judge complete discretion. That would be great. I don't think that there's political will for that at all. Um, but if if people want to talk about uh, getting rid of Measure 11 because it restricts judges, uh, I would say then let's also get rid of the guideline caps because those actually restrict judges even more than Measure 11. Well, a lot of folk, a lot of yeah. times people don't talk about that uh, when they want to talk about uh, judicial discretion, which is an important principle. Absolutely. Uh, but if you only talk about mandatory minimums without talking about how caps restrict discretion, then that tells me a little bit about kind of the philosophy of criminal justice that that person might have. Well, I, I, I would be opposed to total discretion. Be, I mean, it doesn't happen very often, but you hear about these cases where a child molester gets six months or something and he did mm -hmm. something horrendous. You know, I, I'm worried about that one rogue judge that would, you know, not hold someone accountable I don't think we have any judges in our area like that, but these are normally back east cases. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I, I would like some some kind of 
parameters that a, a guy holds up somebody with a gun. Mm -hmm. He needs to go away. And so, so I would, I would say, uh, I think, I think we have a good system. Yeah, I think we have a good system right now. And so, uh, for someone like yourself who wants to have some of those guidelines in place, well, we we do have those. Mm -hmm. We do have those in place. We can take one more break here on Valley Talk. More with uh, Doug Martini, the district attorney here in Lynn County, average investment guy John Gibson, and we're going to talk more about. Oh. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about white collar crime. Have we seen an increase of that because of the economy, forgery, that kind of thing? And just, just what are we seeing as far as the crime stats? I don't know if you brought some there with you today. Yeah. What's going on? What are we seeing increasing, decreasing? Just what's going on on the street, so to speak? Uh, we were talking about sentencing guidelines. And as we were talking about that a moment ago, I was thinking about um, a lot of people like the, the Clint Eastwood Dirty Harry thing. Make my day. <laughs> or Beretta, remember him? You, you, you do the crime, you got to do the time. And I think, back to sentencing guidelines, I think uh, the citizenry of Oregon would like to say, hey, you know, you do it, you got to go to jail. In the, in the end, I think what we're all shooting for is justice. If we can achieve justice, then uh, that deters crime. It actually helps victims to heal. If you don't see justice happen, uh, it's a little bit harder sometimes for victims to heal. Uh, Good point. Justice is what we're, what we're really seeking for. Valley Tuck, back in a moment. Are you thinking about getting new windows but aren't excited about spending three to four hours with a pushy salesperson from out of town? Hi, this is Brian at Smith Glass. We offer double and triple pane windows with a lifetime warranty for much less than those Portland or Seattle guys. Plus, we're your neighbors. Our salespeople are friendly and helpful. Visit us today on Southwest 3rd in Corvallis or at the foot of the Lion Street Bridge in Albany or on the web at smith-glass.com. On the cutting edge since 1945. GoToMeeting is the powerfully simple way to meet and collaborate online. Here's MindJet's chief marketing officer, Yasha Kakis wolf telling us why he believes in GoToMeeting. For us, using GoToMeeting is our answer. It's the way that we move forward. It's what allows us to be successful. We're able to share the ideas, the plans with everybody um, inside of our company and out of our company. Visit GoToMeeting.com. Click the Try It Free button and enter promo code 45 for a free 45-day trial. GoToMeeting. Meeting is believing. Perry locked himself out of his car. Should he A, call his amateur wrestler friend with fists of steel, or B, get roadside assistance from the Geico mobile app? The correct answer is B. The Geico mobile app uses GPS, so Perry can get roadside assistance quickly without saying a word. It's like telepathy. Perry's steel-fisted friend would dent up the door and break stuff. Geico's mobile app is speedy and makes it easy for Perry to get roadside assistance with the tap of his finger. Geico. Wherever, whenever. Just a click away with our free mobile app. There are a lot of things we need to talk about in the Mid-Willamette Valley. Hi, I'm Dave Adams, KGAL Radio. We want to have those conversations on this radio station live. That's what we do every Monday through Friday from 11 to noon. Maybe it's taxes, roads, government, city council, school boards, whatever. I also want to know what you want to talk about. Email me, dave at kgal.com, and join the conversation. Valley Talk, 11 a.m., Monday through Friday, News Talk, 1580 KGAL. You've seen the cash cab on TV. Now win prizes with a brand new cab service in the mid Willamette Valley. Introducing Call Me a Cab Taxi Service. Get your picture taken with Call Me a Cab Taxi Service. Post it on their Facebook and you can win a prize. Treating seniors and everyone with respect and dignity in a courteous, comfortable, affordable ride. Call 541-979-TAXI. That's 979-8294. Like them on Facebook. Call-me-a-cab. An Albany Chamber member. Helping provide clothing and food boxes at Fish of Albany. Providing children with an advocate in the legal system at Casa of Lynn County. Offering medical care to people without insurance at InReach Services. My name is Judy Barron, and I'm with National Frozen Foods. We support the United Way because they are making a difference right here in the community where we live and work. Please join me in supporting the United Way of Lynn County. Give, advocate, volunteer, live united. Health Talk with Dr. Bob Martin, Sunday mornings on News Talk 1580, KGAL. Hey, welcome back to uh, Valley Talk. I'm Dave Adams. Uh, Doug Martini, Lynn County District Attorney, is with us in the uh, studios right now. And we're talking about uh, a proposed piece of legislation, House Bill, what was it? 3194. 
3194 wants to change or proposes to change the penalty for convictions of sex abuse in the first degree. And you're very opposed to that. Yes. Actually, it proposes three things. Assault in the second degree, which largely is domestic violence. Uh, robbery in the second degree. And the third one, and this one's just outrageous to me, sex abuse in the first degree. Which means what? Uh, it is the touching of intimate parts of children. Well, actually, someone under the age of 14... Uh, or doing that forcibly on someone. But what that means in real life, in this county, I ran the stats in our county, uh, the average age of the victims of sex abuse in the first degree last year for Lynn County was nine. And so uh, there's a proposal in House Bill 3194 where they want to take someone who has a first-time offense for sex abuse in the first degree right now under Measure 11, it is 75 months. Uh, if you take it out of Measure 11, it's 18 months. But then you have to add to it another 30% cut for earned time and then a three-month cut for transitional leave as well. So and they so might serve a year. Here's, here's another interesting stat. Right. Here's another interesting stat is uh, right now, one out of every four girls, and I believe it's one out of six boys, by the time they're 18, are the victim of a sex crime. Mm. That is, is a that stat Lynn that... Is that Lynn County or is that statewide? or where Nationwide. 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 Okay. Uh, if I were to tell you that someone, that one out of four people suffered from a particular sickness, we'd say that's an epidemic. That's outrageous. We need to re put some resources into this. Well, one out of four are victims of child sex crimes mm. for, for little girls and one out of six for little boys. And then to go backwards in our sentencing laws when we have that kind of a problem, uh, it, it just makes no sense. I, I, I can't believe it's it's under the umbrella label of public safety because it has nothing to do with public what safety. What legislation is that? That's House Bill 3194. And okay. so basically 75 months is how long, How many years? That's like six uh, years. Was it 5.8? 5.8. Uh, so you're going from 5.8 5. 5. 5. 5. to right. 1, basically. Well, down Roughly. to 18 months, but 18 then months yeah, we of... put in all those calculations that I uh, Crazy. gave you before. And what's the name of the people that did this, the government? Well, uh, this, is, this, uh, is so funny. this came out of the Governor's Commission on Public Safety. <laughs> on Public so. Safety. All right. God. Is there... One of the things that, uh, and we had a story, and I don't have the sto I don't have the case in front of me, but there was a, and we talked about this before we went on the air. Let's say you have a uh, teenage girl, teenage girl, the hormones are raging, uh, the boy is an adult, the girl is not, they have sex, she changes her mind and charges rape. And uh, uh, what, is, what happens here in Oregon or Lynn County? Uh, first of all, uh, I know that's very vague. Yes, we, we always have to... These, these cases are driven by what the facts are. Go ahead. And uh, in Oregon, if, if someone is within three years of uh, the victim's age, then uh, there's an absolute defense for that. So if you have an adult uh, and a minor uh, who are having sex, if they're within three years of each other, then uh, they have an absolute defense to any crime that's brought against them on that. So, But the stats you just quoted about boys and girls, one in... <coughs> One in four for girls, one in six for boys. That's huge. Yep. Have we noticed an increase, let's say, the past uh, 10 years or 15 years? Have we noticed an escalation of the crimes? And is that actually the question I've got, have we, are we seeing more crimes being committed or more crimes being reported? Those are good questions. Good questions. What I can tell you is this. Sure. Um, last year, the number three felony that we prosecuted was sex abuse in the first degree. Uh, that's a number that bothers me immensely. Uh, this year, it dropped to number five. So that's, that's a good trend. It's going backwards. But it was 105 cases of sex abuse in the first degree that we prosecuted last year in Lynn County alone. Uh, people don't realize this happens a lot. And, uh, you know, it, the Sandusky uh, thing in Penn State brought a lot of stuff to the front. But uh, yeah. this happens a lot. Okay, Doug Martini, thank you for being with us today. I'd like to have you Thanks, back Dave. again on the Thanks show. And yeah, then, man, uh, come John, back anytime. John Thanks. Gibson, tomorrow on the show, ABC House, talk about child abuse. We're going to have them here. They uh, treat the victims of that. Also, Will Summers, we're talking about WorkSource Oregon and what's going on in the employment picture. This is Valley Talk. Thank you for being with us today. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow. If you know. Locally owned and operated, this is the very independent News Talk 1580 KGAL, Lebanon, Albany, Corvallis.